The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the ninth chapter. As Jesus passed by, he saw a man blind from his birth. And Jesus and his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And Jesus answered, It was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be made manifest in him. We must work the works of him who sent me, While it is day, night comes when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. And he said, as he said this, he spat on the ground and made clay of the spittle and anointed the man's eyes with the clay, saying to him, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. So he went and washed and came back, seeing... And the neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar said, Is not this the man who used to sit and beg? Some said, It is he. Others said, No, but he is like him. He said, I am the man. And they said to him, Then how were your eyes opened? He answered, The man called Jesus made clay and anointed my eyes and said to me, Go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and received my sight. And they said to him, Where is he? He said, I do not know. And they brought to the Pharisees the man who had formerly been blind. Now it was a Sabbath day when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. The Pharisees again asked him how he had received his sight. And he said to them, He put clay on my eyes, and I washed, and I see. Some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others said, How can a man who is a sinner do such signs? There was a division among them. So they again said to the blind man, What do you say about him since he has opened your eyes? And he said, He is a prophet. The Jews did not believe that he had been blind and received his sight until they called the parents of the man who had received his sight and asked him, Is this your son who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? His parents answered, We know that this is our son, and that he was born blind. But how he now sees, we do not know. Nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him, he is of age. He will speak for himself. His parents said this because they feared the Jews. For the Jews had already agreed that if anyone should confess him to be the Christ, he was to be put out of the synagogue. Therefore his parents said, He is of age, ask him. So the second time they called the man who had been blind and said to him, Give God the praise. We know that this man is a sinner. And he answered, Whether he is a sinner, I do not know. One thing I know, that though I was blind, now I see. They said to him, What did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? And he answered them, I have told you already, and you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you too want to become his disciples? And they reviled him, saying, You are his disciple, but we, we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. The man answered, Why? This is a marvel. You do not know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes? We know that God does not listen to sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, God listens to him. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could not do he could do nothing. They answered him, "You were born in utter sin, and would you teach us?" And they cast him out. Jesus heard that they had cast him out, and having found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? And he answered, And who is he, sir, that I may, I may believe in him? Jesus said to him, You have seen him, and it is he who speaks to you. He 
He said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. And Jesus said, For judgment I came into the world, that those who do not see may see, and that those who may see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees near him heard this, and they said to him, Are we also blind? Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would have no guilt. But now that you say we see, your guilt remains. The Gospel of the Lord. Thanks Thanks be to God. God. Let us pray. Gracious God, you have smeared us with your love. You have covered us with your Son and his blood and his body. Through our baptism, O Lord, you have drawn us again to this place, around your word and around this meal that strengthens our faith. Help us to hear this word again this morning, to help help it by your Holy Spirit to fill us with faith. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful people and kindle in us the fire of your love such that the scales of our sin fall from our eyes. Help us, Lord, to go out into the world and to share the good news so that others who are blind as well may come to see your love and the works that you do. Now, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing to you, O Lord, our rock and our salvation. Amen. Please be seated. Now, as I was preparing uh, for the sermon this morning, I came across a story about a young woman named Lydia. Now, Lydia, you see, was a good student, a very talented musician. She had a great sense of humor. I'm sure someone, all of us, would enjoy being around. But there was one fact that dominated her life, you see. And that she was born blind, like the man in our story for today. And she had sought healing. She prayed to God. She visited healing services of various churches and famous faith healers. You know, I know we don't hear so much about them today. But you know, I mean, they used to be around a lot, right? So we know who we're talking about here. All kinds of different groups of folks. But Lydia always seemed to come away disappointed. Worried that she didn't have enough faith. And she longed to have the faith the healers had commanded. Outwardly, of course, she was confident that God would heal her. But deep inside, she quietly wondered why God had not already chosen to heal her. Yes, God does use providential care as well as miracles to heal. However, Scripture also shows that suffering and loss are part of the plan, part of a life as his disciple. It's too simple, I think, to say that God wants his people to enjoy perfect health all the time or a perfect life all the time. God does use suffering for his purpose. And I think no story in the Bible clearly shows this more than our gospel text for today. So the disciples asked the question, Jesus, who sinned? I mean, the man or his parents? Who sinned? Who? I mean, obviously, you know, something went wrong, right? I mean, that was the prevalent theology of the day. The idea that, that uh, suffering comes with, with doing, uh, going against God's will. And that good life, great things, prosperity, no challenge, that must mean you're living well. Unfortunately, what this really reveals to us is that human wisdom, that kind of thinking, has no room for something we call the theology 
of the cross. The theology of the cross is at work here to be sure. God is at work to reveal His mercy, His tender compassion. Oh, the word compassion in the Bible, in the Greek. It's, I, I, I can't even pronounce it. I mean, it's just, it's, it's got too many G's and I mean, it's like diphthongs left and right. You can't say it, but literally it just means an emotion that, that wells up from your belly, from the stomach, from your bowels. Something we look at and we hear a story about Lydia or uh, so many other challenges and sufferings. We, we, we bleed from our souls when we hear these things. When we suffer them ourselves, it is that same place that we look up toward heaven and ask, Why, God? Why? Suffering first comes so that God's mercy is revealed. So Jesus responds, It is not the sin the man, nor his parents. He rejects the question really outright altogether. But for the works of God to be revealed, Jesus says in our text for today. So I got kind of curious about that, you see. I mean, it's just so interesting that, that, that with this phrase, doing the works of God, would be dropped in there. But it doesn't work like that. That's not how Scripture works. So I, I kind of you know, not Google. I mean, it's, we have a little. I have a little Bible program that helps me. It's almost like cheating, you know. But it, it's almost like Googling the Bible, right? It's a little little computer program. So I, I Googled works of God in the Gospel of Saint John, and sure enough, there it was, popped right up. The the disciples, the group gathered around Jesus. They had been following him around. He'd fed five thousand people, so that was a pretty good. You know, I'm good. Hey, all right. You know, 5,000 people got fed with a couple loaves and some fish. I'm following that guy around. So they followed him around and he started to chastise them. You're walking around me looking for the bread that, that does not last. And he goes, this is the same chapter where Jesus talks about being the bread of life. It's chapter 6. And then Jesus talks about doing the works of God. And the disciples respond, well, what do we need to be doing to be doing the works of God? And, and Jesus answered the question very succinctly. He said, to be doing the works of God means to believe in the one whom the Father has sent. Jesus heals a man by which he is drawing others to faith. And Jesus anoints the man with saliva thought to have curative powers in those days. And then he dispatches the man to a pool named Scent. Isn't that interesting? I mean, obviously God doesn't waste words in Scripture. It's a reminder that Jesus was sent by the Father. It's always stuff like that that distracts you. There we go. Was sent by the one who the Father to the blind, also the blind man was sent as well. So Jesus was the sent one as well as one, the young man who had been sent to this pool. The theme of sending, of course, <coughs> the mission of Christ, we are reminded, <coughs> becomes his disciples' mission to draw others out of their spiritual blindness. Yes, this is a this is an extraordinary healing event which we witness in our gospel text for today. So much so that the religious authorities are invited, they're consulted to come in and, and ask for their opinion. Is this Jesus the Messiah? The chosen one? The anointed? Like David of old? Is this the one come to, to lead us, your people? Is he sent from God? And of course there's division in the midst of the Pharisees. This is a, a, obviously he's either a violator of the law. I mean that, that very quickly gets pointed out. Jesus had done this healing on a Sabbath. Well that's quite a bit of a no-no if you understand Jewish law. I mean the way the, the law uh, is interpreted, that third commandment. You shall, you shall uh, honor the, whole, the Sabbath and keep it holy. Now, now I tell you what, they're very serious about this. In Israel, you see. I remember several years ago, having gone to Israel, we were in Jerusalem during Advent. 
Uh, and I was, we were staying in a very nice western hotel just right off the, the old quarter just outside the Damascus Gate. And it was a very tall hotel, uh, nice, you know, at several elevators. But on Friday afternoon, right exactly at 5 o'clock, the elevator doors opened up and all the lights on the, the panels lit up. And the elevators began to stop at every floor. Why? Because it's work to push a button on the Sabbath. And you should not do work on the Sabbath. So clearly, obviously, if, if that kind of thinking cont- spreads and continues to this day, I and mean, that's the, the, the prevalence of the idea of keeping that law. But unfortunately, they had forgotten Hosea 6.6. 6. And that was something that, that uh, several times had to be reminded of a very law-oriented culture and faith, and religion, I should say. Is that God desires mercy more than sacrifice. In fact, Jesus had done the very same thing. If we go to in Matthew, where he's talking about feeding people and, and the hunger on the Sabbath, well, well, shall we not pick a head of grain from the field so that we may eat and not starve to death? Or what about a man with a withered hand? Shall I not heal him on the Sabbath? Clearly they had forgotten the Son of Man was also the Lord of the Sabbath. The formerly blind man, of course, can proclaim at first that Jesus is a prophet. But at that second interrogation, they are able to proclaim, this man clearly is a sinner. He violates the law of the Sabbath. Luther says, and Luther kind of has an interesting take on this. He writes, we keep the Sabbath day holy when we do not despise preaching and his word, but hold it sacred and gladly learn from it and hear it. So clearly, Christ is showing God's compassion and love for his people. The works, the same kinds of works that bring others to faith. So the Pharisees, of course, look at the man and say, Give glory to God! Meant to, in essence, reject Jesus as a sinner, not one sent by the Father. But this miracle of Jesus was not enough to convince the religious authorities of the origin of Jesus. And they say, You were born blind? You were born in sin? And yet, you would teach us? Hmm. It's like a little pride to me. Pride and the inability to recognize our own sin, yet see the sin in others. Something like pulling the plank out of your own eye when you see the speck in someone else's. It's an indication of spiritual blindness. So the man is put out of the synagogue and encounters Jesus on the outside. Actually, he's put out of the temple there in Jerusalem. Not just any old synagogue. He's put out of the temple. That's a pretty serious thing. He finds Jesus. Jesus asks him, Do you believe in the Son of Man? And he asks, Who is it? Jesus says, It is I. And he fell down and worshipped him. You see, the man's faith grew from acknowledging Jesus to a prophet to confessing him to be from God and finally honoring him as Lord. You see, Jesus did not come to condemn the world. I mean, he talks about coming to judge the world, to be true. He does not come to condemn the world, John tells us in chapter 3, but to save it. Salvation comes by faith as a gift of grace from God. This grace is the work of the Spirit, removing scales from all of our eyes. His his coming is indeed a judgment. However, because those who cling to their blindness 
and reliance upon human wisdom rather than by faith brings everlasting condemnation. I mean, there's a real connection there between our first lesson and our, our text, our gospel text. I, 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 if, I had, if I were doing in fact, I had thought in my head about a, a children's homily. It's kind of like when you gather kids together to pick a game, right? Okay, who's going to be on what team and who's going to be on the other? And inevitably, the, you got two kids or they're the captains, and they start looking out into the crowd. Who's the fastest? Who's the biggest? Who's the strongest? But you have to be able to tell this by looking at someone. How can you do that? I, I guess those kind of things always were seared into my head because when I was, I was always the last one, right? Have you ever been as a kid being the last one somebody picked? That's human wisdom for you right there. I mean, interestingly enough, Jesse does the same thing and he's bringing his oldest, the, the best looking, the strongest, the, you know, the, the, the talented ones. And then the last one, Samuel says, well, where's your last, where's your, is this all your son? He said, no, but the last one, he's kind of a little kid. He's got a ruddy looking face. He's kind of, you know, been out in the mud and the, and the dirt and he's been hanging out with sheep. That's not the one you want. is the one spiritually blind refuse to acknowledge their sin and their need for a savior in spite of what God's word says about sin and the human condition it is only when we recognize our own blindness can we begin to see the real light of the world you see Jesus alone gives both physical as well as spiritual sight by faith through water and the word, God has delivered us from the domain of darkness through our Savior, who has called us to the light to know and to follow Him. When faith healers told Lydia that she did not have enough faith, they clearly were not pointing to the works of God, but to her works. Isn't that really what it's all about? It's not about us. It's about what has God done for us by His grace. They failed to encourage her to trust in God and His plan. The faith healers failed to see that God works through physical conditions, loss and suffering, as well as through miracles. They directed her away from the cross. Jesus' own suffering and resurrection. And in so doing, they were, they were directing her away from her very eternal salvation. We too, as Jesus' disciples, who understand the theology of the cross, should not be blinded by the theology of glory, which tells us that God means to make us prosperous, healthy, and happy in everything we do in this life. Rather, Christ preaching directs us to look for his blessings in the midst of all circumstances and seek opportunities to do the works of God through Christ to bring others to faith, which allows us to praise God for working through more than miracles, but also through pain, suffering, loss, and yes, even death on the cross Jesus suffered for us in weakness to remove our spiritual blinders. In baptism, he washed our spiritual eyes and cleansed our souls. Through his suffering, he grants healing and the blessings, blessings of heaven. For we truly know by faith the words of Paul. His grace is sufficient for all our needs. God's grace is is truly amazing. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us take a moment to reflect on His Word and His will for our lives.